Um, one of the things I'd like to do to get started um, is maybe do a little bit in terms of historical context. Um, if you look at it, you know, the, the title of this is Full Transparency Product Declarations, what you need to avoid 20 more years of greenwash. Um, that, that's actually, I think, a very I important thing to think about. We are at a critical crossroads today that really comes across once every 20 years or so in terms of where you have a legitimate opportunity to set a direction for where the industry is going to go. The last time we were at an opportunity like we have today was 1991-92-93 at the formation of the USGBC and the original introduction of LEED. Um, unfortunately, I'm old enough to, to remember those days vividly. Um, and at those times, one of the things in the original versions of LEED that, that were looked at was the desire to take on product. Okay, that real, recognizing this was a building rating system, but a building was comprised of product, you really needed to evaluate product. But for various reasons at the time, available science, external pressures, um, and just trying to get a small nonprofit started at the time, uh, the decision was to go basically focused on attributes at that time. And what you got out of the attributes, which gave the, the structure, the materials and resource section, of lead for the past basically 20 years has always been at product attribute based, but never product holistically based. And so what you got was 20 years of what I call products with sustainable attributes. And you got very few sustainable products. And they are very, very different. Um, my analogy to it really isn't any different than, for example, uh, now I'm really going to date myself going how old. If you go back to quality control, if you go back in the 70s, manufacturers looked at quality control as an additional cost. It was a bolt-on. It was an end-of-line function. So they'd make whatever it is they were going to make, and at the end of the line, they'd inspect it. Work didn't work. There were companies that lived legitimately value whether it was worth having that or just letting the product go. And then came along Crosby TQM, then came... Uh, Six Sigma and everything else, and all of a sudden people realized that quality could actually save you money. And if you integrated it into your whole process from beginning to end, you would save money as a manufacturer and you'd produce a better product. It was a win-win situation. We're really no different than that with sustainability today. What happened was when you got products with sustainable attributes, the bolt-on function was an end of line. You took an existing product and then at the end of the line you tried to cram recycled content into it. Or you tried to put a bio-based or rapidly renewable content in it. Same old product, just with a different something crammed on the end. And usually they charge you more for the courtesy. We would charge you more for the courtesy, I should say. I come from the manufacturing side. Um, and I can give you examples even worse within the industry of how that happened and, and how it was just very wrong in terms of getting these products with sustainable attributes. Sustainable products are when you bring sustainability in all the way at the beginning. And it starts in your supply chain and your raw material selection all the way through and has a seat at the table. And the end result is honestly for a manufacturer, um, it's going to generate a better bottom line. But that knowledge isn't really there present. So what brings us to this once in every 20 year crossroads that I'm talking about. And really the change for this started, you know, nothing goes fast in the industry. The change for this started around 2007, 2006, 2007. Was the argument over how do you measure sustainability? How do you look at sustainability from a product point of view? And the term, you know, you got lots of great terms, uh, you know, cradle to grave and all this great marketing feel good stuff. In the end, the science came down to be what's called LCA science. And what changed it all, like changed everything else. Like we did the first third party, peer reviewed, independent LCA study of a product. In 2000, we published it. First available for the public. Cost us $300,000 to do it. So it wasn't a viable technology to expect a small manufacturer to do this or to do one of those for every product platform. But that was the state of science that day. There came in 2006, 2007, a software program called Gabby, G 
capital G, small a, capital B, small i. And if you know what your product's made out of, which if you're a manufacturer, you should, and if you know your energy supply chain, so you know how much energy you consume, and you know is it fossil fuel, is it nuclear, is it hydro, is it wind, what is it? You plug those two inputs into this, and the software will give you all the data that you need. Then could the industry no longer fight LCA science, because the data is there. You couldn't argue with it. And so that's really what says today, now it's a matter of how do you parse out the data. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is this word full transparency. Because the world is full of controlled transparency of giving you just the information that you want and just the information that you're going to like and not necessarily all the information you need to make a decision. So that's really the context as a background as we go through this. Any questions there? And my slide won't go forward. I did, I was doing the right left. And it worked before. Mm -hmm. of if I just have to push a button, just show me what I have to push. There we go. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry about that brief interruption. Now for something completely different. Um, first of all, I think if we're going to talk about this, what does it mean to be sustainable? And, you know, we start everything, we try and look externally for definitions. I think that's an important way to look at it. And actually, fundamentally, the definition of sustainable development um, goes back to the United Nations Frontland Commission report in 1987. And I think what's important when you read it, when it says sustainable development is developed that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's actually a pretty good statement because nowhere in there does it say my product's perfect. Nowhere does it say I have zero impact because there's nothing that has zero impact. Anybody that tells you, oh, this, oh I have no impact, or not, it's, everything we do has an impact. It's a matter of quantifying, measuring it, understanding it, and making sure it doesn't compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's actually the reality because there is no zero that's out there today that's out there today. There's a lot of promises for 2025. I'm more interested in today. The other thing it said, and this is what's really gotten forgotten over the years, is the other thing that came out of the Brentland Commission report is it actually says there's three dimensions that make up a sustainability policy. There's an economic dimension. So one of the things, economic dimension can be useful life of a product, what it costs to do, use the product. Um, and so, for example, I, when, when I talk about where EPDs are, the economic dimension really isn't considered. Um, the social dimension, this is, a, this is a popular one to leave off the table. Social dimension is, is a recognition, social equity, your business practices in third party countries. Um, for example, you know, doing reporting of your ratio of your highest paid employee to your lowest paid employee. And trust me, if the CEO's ratio is two million to one, and he wants to get that down to a million to one, he's probably not going to take a pay cut. I'm just bad. Um, and this is where we're at. Everyone talks about the third place, the environmental dimension. And this is where all the focus for the last 20 years has really been on this discussion of what's the environmental dimension. dimension. But what's happening today is this is getting separated. This is actually getting carved into pieces between what's considered environment and what's considered health. I'm just going to ask you a simple question. I think most people in this room have an interest in sustainability. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. What was your initial interest? Most of the time, it related probably more to health than it did. You looked at smog. You looked at a landfill. You looked at, a, in my case, when I grew up in the city, a very polluted river. And you said, uh, something's probably not right there. You know, you see a fish dead on the bank with four eyes, probably not ideal. And 
Pardon me? Exactly. And then you go the other direction and you go, you ask the question, what does that mean to my health? What does that mean to the health of my family? And what you're seeing right now in this whole EPD, HPD discussion is a separation of the environmental discussion where one group is trying to keep it strictly to nice environmental criteria you can measure and another group saying, hey, you can't forget about health. You know, that may be where the dirty little secret is that nobody wants to talk about, but you have to acknowledge that it's there. Lots of acronyms in this, but let's talk about, um, get into the, the, the agreed upon science. I mentioned LCA science. LCA science is this general data, and that's where that software package has made it so available to actually have the measurements. But it's basically a tremendous amount of data associated with your product that measures everything that your product in Im defined impact categories from the beginning to the end of the product, whatever that that is. So, and there, there's very defined elements. But the way you make an EPD, you're going to start off with the data. But the data is generic. I have first of all a question. Has anybody had any exposures with EPDs? Anybody dealt with one yet? So obviously no one's read one because anybody, if you don't have a sleeping disorder, there's no reason to read an EPD, to be honest. Um, but what happens is the, the LCA gets run through what's called a product category rule. You have to define how you're going to measure it. So what are your units of measure in terms of it? So if it's flooring, it's defined as one square meter, right? Flooring is also defined for one year. Remember what I said about the economic dimension? The fact that one product may last 30 years and another product may last five years is never factored into this calculation. You should be clear with that because it looks at it over one year of life. Um, if it's paint, I forget what the measurements are for paint, but again, there's a different category. There's a different volume associated with the paint and a different useful life, and these are all defined for each of the different categories. So you've got all this data. The PCR also defines what you measure in this data. So you've got this whole huge amount of data. The PCR also defines that. And what happens is you take the data in the LCA, you run it through a PCR, and your output's an EPD. It's that simple. Standard format, that's what you get. So that's, does anyone have a question on how you make the EPD? So you, you run what your product's made out of and um, what your energy supply chain is and all that. Through this, you get a bunch of data. You run that data through the product category rule, whatever your product category is. So whether it's flooring, whether it's paint, whether it's furniture, whether it's you will be able to run it through, and then your output will be this EPD. Okay. When you look at it, people want the EPD to be an industry standard. So let's first ask the question, what makes a good industry standard? Basically you look for three things. One, you want it to be consensus-based, with all relevant stakeholders having a seat at the table. Okay, everyone understand what I mean is that, you know, no one should have their own. Consensus process is a messy process, isn't always a fast process, but no one gets exactly what they want, but everybody gets something of what they want is usually the, the best way for this process to go through. So what we're saying is, it shouldn't be manufactured, but it, it's manufactured, it's architects. It's building owners, developers, NGOs. Everyone gets a relevant seat at the table to be able to represent their interest and hopefully the output of it enables everyone to have a seat at the table. If it's environmental, it should be full life cycle or full LCA, um, preferably equal weighted. I used to start off a lot of environmental talks with a simple question. What's more important to you, clean water or clean air? Please don't answer. Because the answer is you want both. But you'd be amazed how many people will sit there, they'll think, and they'll go, oh, you know what, I'll go with water. I'll go with air. But the whole point of the matter is, the reason we talk about equal weighted and full LCA, the history of the environmental movement is littered with some of the worst decisions made for some of the best intentioned reasons. All right? 
I'll give you an example. Uh, was the MTB additive in gasoline? Um, again, I don't know how many people who are old enough to drive up saw the sticker in the winter, which looking outside today is a never-ending winter, but it used to be during the, the winter season they put an additive in gasoline, MTBE, to reduce smog formation in the winter, which it did a great job of that. Unfortunately, it was a total disaster for groundwater. I mean, there are still communities today where you don't have drinkable groundwater because the MTB would meld with the emissions from the engine would come down in the rain, would contaminate grass water, um, groundwater. So again, well-intentioned, reduced smog formation during the winter months, but a very, very bad outcome. Okay? And this is... You're going to answer this later, but oh, on that point, right, are environmentalists We're going to get into that. You're going to get in, we're going to get very clearly into that. And I... I I might have been a little brasher in my entry, as I, would I not be being recorded right now? But anyway. <laughs> um, and also, testing and certification must be third party and separate from the standard development body. body. What that means is a standard needs to be a standard, not a business model. Okay? And so what happens is if you, have, if you develop the standard, you can have nothing to do with the products that get certified to it. You cannot have a business interest. Um, if you, people go back a few years, there was a, a very popular movement at one point for a, a standard called C2C, or cradle to cradle. It was really two areas where this, it fell down. One of them was this, is that they were own certification body. Second was it was a little bit of black box in terms of how they determined green. The science wasn't transparent. That was, that was part of the issue too. But this was actually sort of the biggest area where it, that, for example, had momentum but then lost it because you really couldn't support it for that reason. So let's look at LCA first. LCA consists of basically, I mean, you can go into Wikipedia anywhere else, look at what LCA science is. It'll have, there's a raw materials phase, a pre-processing of those raw materials, a production piece, a transport piece, an installation, a use and maintenance, and end of life. That's generically what an LCA is. It looks at that. And it generically looks at all these impact categories. So every one of your raw materials at the raw material phase, it looks at ecotoxicity, human toxicity, abiotic depletion, that's non-renewables, acidification potential, acid rain, eutrophication potential, if you have an agricultural-based product, those are algae blooms um, uh, from fertile, over-fertilization or, or runoff, global warming potential, CO2 emissions, ozone layer depletion, CFC, photochemical ozone creation potential, those ethylenes, so that one is, this is, this is stratospheric, this is tropospheric, so low level, and embodied energy, so how much goes into the product. So you take all your raw materials, you take all your activities, you measure all these impact categories. That's that huge set of data that says LCA. It's an important piece. Everyone get that? So generic science, this isn't invented, this is... Look it up anywhere in terms of the way science, when they define LCA, this is how an LCA is defined. The PCR that we talked about, and now we're getting into the way it works, and just as a side, so you understand flooring tends to be on the front of a lot of these discussions when it comes to interior finishes, and people want to understand why. It's because most flooring manufacturers have substantial control of their supply chain. It's much easier for us to do it than it is, for example, a furniture manufacturer that may source parts from, you know, 300, 400, 500 different sources and all that. Textile industry, they've, you know, vertically integrated well up their supply chain. Our supply chain's pretty simple. Most of the supply chains on this, we've either integrated into it or it's very simple to control. So that's why flooring tends to be on the front of these discussions and it's important because it then sets the trend for others. So, who developed the flooring PCR? Let's get this out of the way first. NSF International, which is a, a testing group, collaborated with flooring trade organizations. So it was the Carpet and Rug Institute, it was the Resilient Floor Covering Institute, the National Wood Flooring Association, North American Laminate Flooring, and the Tau Council of North America. Do you see any architects or designers on there? Do you see any end users on there? Do you see any NGOs on there? See anybody other than the fox? Anybody other than the fox guarding the hen house? 
This is one of the first questions that comes up because here's what happened in the PCR. When they developed the PCR, again, your product category rule to apply the LCA, these are the categories they included in it. So the abiotic depletion, acidification potential, eutrophication potential, global warming, ozone layer depletion, the photochemical and hazardous, not hazardous waste. So those, I mean, those are the categories in it. But what did it specifically exclude? ecotoxicity and human health. And that's actually the big issue. If you go back to what I asked you beginning, why do most of us even care about sustainability in the first point? It was because of these two categories, yet they explicitly exclude it. This goes back to that first slide when I talked about the environmental dimension is now getting split apart between what you could categorize as environment and this health issue on the side. And they're saying it really can't be measured. That's sort of the argument. Uh, I'm not going to go there. Um, so this is, the big, this is the big difference in terms of the way product is measured. And this is why, what sort of opens the door. So what's a standard? We talked about being consensus-based, full LCA-based, and independent third-party testing. So if you look at the flooring PCR, it is not consensus-based. It's not full LCA-based they do have independent third-party testing and certification. So start off, you've got to ask a question <laughs> right up front about this. So what gets you to full disclosure and transparency? And now, again, the reason I gave that historical context um, is you, you, you're dealing with, in, in the case of, for example, the American Chemical Lobby, one of the strongest lobbying groups in the country probably makes them one of the strongest lobbying groups in the world. Um, in the early phases, you are, how would you describe it? You, you can reach a point of intimidation. I'm not afraid to say, even on recording, I got a stack of letters on my desk from their fancy legal counsels in Washington, D.C., telling me all the things that I have to stop saying, okay, because they don't like it. And so I'm waiting for the next letter. It'll come when it comes, and then it'll be good because if they actually do anything, then I can have the discussion in the public domain. Um, but the whole idea was, you know what? Fundamentally, the way they measure EPD, there's nothing wrong with it for the categories it measures. And rather than swim uphill and try and reinvent the wheel, uh, a group called the HPDC looked and said, you know what? If we just build on top of that as a foundation, we do get to the whole picture we want. So instead of going, you know what, that EPD isn't any good, well, actually, for what it measures, it actually does do a fair job of measuring. There's nothing wrong with what it measures. What the problem is, what they leave out. So the whole idea of the EPD is the EPD builds on top of it. And that's the idea that these, with these two, you then move towards full disclosure. So the HPD was developed by the Health Product Declaration Collaborative. It is a consensus organization, uh, architects, building owners, developers, product manufacturers. Um, it's making progress as, as quickly as it can. They now have third-party certification on board, um, which di they didn't in the early phases, but is coming rapidly. Um, so HPDC created the HPD Open Standard to choose free of charge, because what it is is it's really just a disclosure. Um, and it facilitates an apples-to-apples -apples comparison and clear discussion about product formulation. It incorporates data from the EPD, plus trustworthy, verifiable measurements, ingredients, and impact ecotoxicity and human toxicity. Once you start entering the level of discussion of chemicals, you, 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 it's the proverbial third rail of discussions in terms of, of how things can go sideways. But it truthfully represents the toxicity impact of a product on people who live with it and the natural environment it exists within. Um, these are important to remember. It uses an open source approach. The whole idea of open source approach means you can apply it to multiple product categories. So it's not like level that's a furniture standard or this that's only for flooring or this that's only for it. It can be universally applied in terms of its disclosure. And it creates a single uh, standard to compare products based on their ingredients and comparative health hazards. Um, discussion of uh, chemicals is an interesting one that I'm going to hit on right now. Um, just so you're aware, I made a mention of it. 
Um, a lot of the discussion of toxicity and the, the, the way that we look at chemicals goes back to, and what's brought at the forefront is the Stockholm Chemical Treaty. The Stockholm Chemical Treaty is, goes back to 2001. Um, it was the third of a series of UN conventions globally to discuss chemical impacts and, and their long-term impacts on society. To a large extent, what people were looking at is if you, you, you look at the 60s as being, the 1960s being the advent of the chemical society, um, you now had 30 to 40 years of health measurements to see what had happened during this period of time. And I will say, you know, I said it was the third of a series of conventions. The first two were typical UN conventions that were derailed in a direction to redistribute global wealth as opposed to actually taking a look at what the, the primary topic was. Stockholm Chemical Treaty is actually a fairly pragmatic document. I mean, it even talks about something like DDT. It doesn't say DDT should be banned. It basically says it should be banned everywhere except where the health benefits or risks associated with DDT versus malaria, you know, use it if it's going to be better. I mean, as I said, it's a pretty pragmatic document. That treaty was adopted by every country in the world except seven, um, which would be the United States, um, Italy, Israel, um, Saudi Arabia, and a few that end in Stan. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you have to wonder where we are in the leadership. Is it, is it entirely because, you know, of oil or something like that? Well, it really can't be that. You've got Canada, huge oil producing country. You've got Russia, huge oil producing country. You've got lots of places, you know, what is the issue? Why don't you disclose? And that's actually one of the questions I'd love to have answered. That gave rise, just as, as part of this history lesson, that also gave rise, because the EPA could not get it looked at. So has anybody heard the term chemicals of concern? Okay, the term chemicals of concern was the EPA's attempt to at least get a portion of the Stockholm Chemical Treaty addressed. So they said, okay, well, out of that chemical treaty, these four, these four groups of chemicals are really bad. Like everybody agrees on it. And we should really take a look at this. And they still couldn't get that through. Uh, they started that in 2009, and the EPA pretty much gave up at the end of last year, saying that that was ever going to go anywhere with Congress um, for approval. So that's sort of the reality of sort of the history. When I talk about the, the strength of a chemical lobby, that's what we're talking about. Now, one of the things they'll say, if you go to people and say, you know what, I want to see that toxicity information, okay? Uh, some manufacturers say, you know what, the EPD reporting format doesn't allow it. And that is not true. Brought this as proof. Uh, this would be, the, the front of this would be the EPD. Now, quite frankly, the first 19 pages or 27 pages or whatever it is, depending on which one of these it's in, has to be in the standard reporting format of the EPD. But it's easy for any manufacturer to do a toxicity addendum. So that's what we did is in the end of ours, we just put, um, so we have a standard EPD, information on all phases of our LCA, including an addendum that approximated the new EPD standard. Now what we've tried to do is take it, and we'll talk about the difference between EPD and versus some of the disclosures that we do. Um, in terms of measuring. But the idea that you can't report it is not true. The other reason I put this, uh -oh. the other reason I put this up here um, is to say, some people say, you know what, there's not a standard measurement technology. Uh, you really can't measure the toxicity. There's no real clear measurements. And this doesn't want to stay on me. Um, and that's not true either. Um, and I put this up here just for the purpose of showing um, there's a system called Use Talks, and it's a trademark modeling system and you see it's being used as the globally recommended preferred model for characterization modeling of human and ecotoxic impacts in LCIA, the United Nations Environment Program, Sea Tackle Life Cycle Initiative. That's a lot of long. What I'm just saying is anyone that says there's not a way to measure toxicity and toxicity potentials, there absolutely is. There absolutely is. You just have to be willing to do it. So 
Again, when you hear people saying, well, I don't want to talk about toxicity, uh, it's not part of the EPD. You can report it anyway. And second is that um, there is a standard measurement methodology for it. There's even a reporting methodology. That's what that standard is. It says when you report, this is the format you have to report it in. So it's very clear um, to be able to do it. And the toxicity measurements break down into ecotoxicity, which is from an environment point of view, and then they break human health into two categories, human toxicity carcinogenic and human toxicity non-carcinogenic. So it makes it very simple. That's just the standard reporting format for it. Um, only put this up here to show that basically these are all your process elements on the left side. So production, transporting to the end of life and all the impact categories and that any manufacturer, if they choose, can report in any of these categories. This has been forcing manufacturers to report. Mm -hmm. Why do we care about any of this? I said at the beginning, nobody wants to read an EPD unless you have a sleeping problem. Nobody in this room, I, 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 can, I feel comfortable in saying, ever wants to actually deal with an EPD. Why is it important? Why do you think it's so important? Why are we fighting over it? It's no different than the foundation of a house. What you, everybody here wants is what comes next. They want the rating system. What they want is a simple way to pick up and say, okay, this product is a four-star product. This is a five-star product. This is a three-star product. This is an A product, this is a B product, this is a C product, whatever. Simple rating system to be able to pick product. That's what you want, okay? You cannot build the rating system if you don't have the right foundation. And that's why this is the critical fight. This is the foundation of the house. It's underneath the ground. Nobody sees it. Nobody cares about it. But you can't build the house if you don't have a solid foundation. If you go back and you just look at the EPD and EPD alone, that's a validation of the status quo. That's all it is. Total validation of the status quo. Every product will be an A product. I guarantee it at the end. The reason I can guarantee it comfortably is the same thing happened in Europe in 2009. Everybody thought, oh, this will be a good first step. And then Bream came as the rating system after. And you'll see Green Globes loves Bream. Um, because Bream makes everything A. Everything's good, all we've done, is, and all we do is validate the status quo. That's one of the reasons trade organizations struggle with their involvement in any environmental issues, because environmental issues require leadership. And trade organizations have to cater to the lowest common denominator. So. Does everyone understand, though, what I'm talking about there in terms of the critical nature of why we have to force this data out? You're not reporting in all these categories. I, there have been so many attempts at this. There's a great software program that was developed by NIST called Bees. The software program itself was designed to be able to model and compare products based on data inputs. It's never been able to be used. It was developed in the early 2000s. It's a great tool, except voluntary reporting by manufacturers. So we reported in all 10 categories. Other manufacturers go, I like these six, but I don't like these four. So I'm not going to report in those. So when you do the actual comparisons, one product is grossly misrepresenting how it performs. <clears throat> and this is the whole thing. The fight for today is to fight for disclosure, to fight for transparency. Because if you don't do the fight now, we're going to get 20 more years of the status, status quo. That's the important piece. You need the EPD and the HPD data. Because once you start getting disclosures, the other absolute truth of manufacturers, what do we do? If we report it, we make it better. If we don't report it, we ignore it. It could be our financial results, but it could also be our sustainability performance. If you force manufacturers to publish it, I guarantee you three years from now it'll be better than it was today, and three years from there it'll be better than it was that day. And three years after that, because if we report it, we fix it. And that's why this information is so critical. And that's why we're at this critical time, because you're building the foundation of the house. If we don't get the foundation right, we don't know what kind of house we're going to get. I just threw this piece in there. Um, this is another uh, EPD disclosure. Um, the reason I included this one 
and why we like SMART so much is that, um, and you're not going to see this, I don't believe, in broad-based usage uh, because it's a very stringent standard. But what's most important, this also brings the social and economic element into it. So there he is social reporting associated with this standard. There is economic reporting calculated into the life. So we're not just looking at one year of use. So if you look at it and you, for example, if you do with institutional buildings, a 30-year service life means a lot more from an environmental profile than a 10-year service life in terms of what, what you do in terms of performance. This standard would recognize it. Uh, again, I don't see this good, and making it the broad base, but I think it's important to know that we're only at the starting point, that there's a lot more that can be done and a lot more that can be brought out. All right. So that's really discussion as it relates to the standards. Are there any questions at this point? I've got some head nods, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going too fast or if I'm connecting. I want to make sure before I go running on that this is making sense to people. Um, we go from there. So the big question. Small question, are you going to talk about the and how this that, that would be next slide. Okay, we're going to go on. And then I agree with you. The ultimate point is you need to make it really easy for the user. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you need to come out with four stars, three stars, or something. Now, we, we're, man, I'm a, we're a manufacturer. We can't do that. Is anybody trying to do that? And if this is going to be voluntary, who do you think needs to actually pay? I'm a believer in market solutions. Um, I think they have a, a stronger exposure if the customer demands it. So who's ever making the decision for the customers and the products? is who needs to demand this information. And so if whether it is the, the architect design making the decision on what goes into it, um, that's clearly an area where we've seen leadership from the marketplace. Um, if you look at it, I think I'm going to show a letter from Canon Design later, but I, there's, I think at this point, 35 of the largest 50 architectural firms have generated similar letters in the country. Um, but as we get into it, one of the things, I'm going to jump back into this and then, then finish up with some of your questions later. You mentioned Declare. There are what I will call toxicity tools out there to work with that you can work with today that are very good. I want to emphasize they are tools. They are not standards. Okay? So Pharos is one. This is probably one of the, the the, the, the best known ones at this point, put together by the Healthy Business Building Network. Uh, it's an online tool for evaluating materials. It's a disclosure tool. Um, and so what it does, you can go into library. So for example, if you're building a building for Google right now, designing a building for Google, Google will tell you to pick your products from Pharos because he knows, they know that the toxicity component has been evaluated in the, the products that are in there. But this is no different than the beginning. This has not been through a consensus process. This is not third party. This is disclosure. It, but it, 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 it's evaluation and presents tools. Declare, um, which is part of the International Living Future Institute, um, is a very interesting idea. And it's basically, the, 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 my analogy to what it is, is, is it's no different than labeling on your food in the grocery store. And instead of going in and looking at and pulling something off the shelf and seeing calories and fat content and salt and nutrition and everything else, <coughs> products would carry a label that, and it, you know, that basically discloses the potentials associated with the impact categories in an LCA. So you would basically evaluate and present those based on the chemical makeup of the product. And that's all it really is. Would you describe it any differently? I mean, it's very simple, easy to use, um, and how you transpose it going forward. Um, and again, yeah, healthy. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right. That's what I'm saying. That's why these are tools, because there's a selection criteria that's been defined by either the Healthy Building Network or the Living Future Institute. So that's why we refer to them as tools as opposed to standards. Um, again, if they get broader adoption and go through the process, they can become a standard. But I, I, I'm very supportive of these because I think they're heading down ideas. And any, the more that we force this issue, the better off that we are. There have been issues, just say, to label with chemicals of concern. Just there was, the, so this is actually, for example, if you look at it, I said the train got out of the station and was gone in Europe uh, between 2009 and 2010. And they realized they lost. Now, Europe has just come back, and all they're doing is forcing labeling that if your product contains a pesticide or biocide, they're going to come back with labeling requirements based on what's in the product. So that's, that's a way of trying to backtrack once that train got out of the station. We don't necessarily want to do it. But a great example of labeling is if the product contained, like one of the things they want to do is have in Declare is labeling if you had one of the chemicals of concern in it. So the analogy or the way I would give it to you, if you walked into Target or wherever to buy a shower curtain and there's a cloth shower curtain and a vinyl shower curtain, the vinyl shower curtain would be required to carry a label that says chemicals, it contains chemicals of concern, which would help you in your buying decision. I do think people will care. Um, but that's an individual decision. And what you're talking about here are, are collective decisions when you look at the building of a building and how a building is fitted out. If you look at long-term studies associated with the chemical society, and that information became public, right? Today, today, reproductive issues among women ages 18 to 25 is greater as a percentage than reproductive issues of women over 40. That's a byproduct of the chemical society. When we get into the end and we start talking about phthalates and endocrine disruptors, okay? They attack, one of the areas they attack is the reproductive issue. Now, if that isn't a sign of those exposures when you're young, yes? To me, it just seems that it also seems like a lot more of the young people have allergy problems and mm -hmm. asthma problems yes. than people of previous generations. Yes. Maybe it's just a coincidence. No, actually it's not. It's not a coincidence. When you look at the irritants and the exposures, fundamentally, I'll go through... There is so much science on this out there, but I'm going to kind of go through the analogy is that a couple things happened. We saw the advent of the chemical society, so we went plastics. I mean, it's interesting. If, if you say can, can things change, it's people still make the decision to smoke. But if you go back, say, look at the advertising in the 30s. Smoking was good for your health, if you remember. If you go back, just look on online. Smoking was the best thing you could do for your health. It was great for weight management, great for everything. Okay? It was, right? Uh, Fast forward about 30 years, and I guarantee you people are going to be looking back at the ads in the 80s that were, do you remember Better Living Through Chemistry? And I'm not talking about college, okay? There were ads companies promoting how much better and healthier life was going to be through all this chemistry. But we're finding out that, I mean, when you look at it, it, it this all goes down to a term called PBT. And if you, that's one of those, another acronym to remember. PBT is persistent bioaccumulative toxin. Okay? Persistent means repetitive exposure. Bioaccumulative means that when it gets into a biological organism, it takes residence there. It stays there. And toxin is, it's toxic. So the best example I could give of a PBT is a pesticide. So when you're out dusting your tomatoes or spraying a pesticide, the only reason the ant dies before you do is you're a lot bigger than the ant. But it, it's basically a PBT. It accumulates in the ant and kills the ant or kills the insect. That comes into your body. It stores in your body. Um, phthalates is a PBT. Um, bromides, PBT. So a lot of the fire retardants that are used in products. Um, all, they accumulate over time. They're more vulnerable to the young. 
So the younger you are, you're growing rapidly, changing rapidly, and this affects how the changes develop. These become the irritants and the allergy. This was exacerbated in the 70s when the energy crisis came. We all started building these airtight boxes for houses. You know, the house I grew up in, the windows were there to s slow the wind down. They didn't stop it. They just slowed it down. Okay? You know, you could, so the house, the house breathed. So you didn't get the hyperexposures. Today, they live in your airtight little box, doesn't turn over the air regular enough in the house, the kids get hyperexposures when they're young to a myriad of things, whether it's emissions, whether it is the, the, all the other traditional allergens, the dust mites, or, you know, they don't get circulated, they don't get cleaned out, they don't get moved. And that's where you get the younger generation gets it. You know, I think the, the probably the most noticeable rise that you could track straight to the chemical society is autism rates and autism related disorder rates up 300 percent um, in the past 30, 40 years just skyrocketed and a lot of this goes to the, the roots of the chemical science. I'm not saying it's bad but if we can be transparent and talk about it then it gets better. That's really the issue. Yes. How do these UPDs protect manufacturers from disclosing proprietary or competitive <coughs> formulations that they've developed? Yeah, that's actually going to be one of the areas where the HPD struggles. Because EPD is a numerical measurement. That's why we want a third party involved. Because the third party signs a non-disclosure with us. We give them all the information. They disclose the cumulative impacts. And impacts are what matter. See, one of the things you're going to find, I'm a big believer impacts would matter. I say to people, you know, you don't like me, you punch me in the face, elbow me in the face, kick me in the face. I really don't care how you did it. What I care about is what the impact did. And that's where we have to get with toxicity. HPD in its current state today is really more about disclosure. It's what am I hitting you with? Is it my hand? Is it my elbow? But it doesn't necessarily quantify yet. And this is why we're a big believer in use talks. Use talks actually discloses the actual impacts. It quantifies it. So that that's why we're a big believer because it says, okay, you've got this much of it in your product. You've got this potential associated with it. Here's your toxicity potential. Some manufacturers may have something that may be totally inert mm -hmm. in their product, but if their competitors saw that it was in there, the light would go off and certain things would... Uh... Everybody has that in their product. Everybody has that in their product. I'm, I'm just going to be blunt. Everybody has, and that's why we have to get to a numerical quantification of what the potentials are. Um, I, you know, and I've been in these conversations with, with other manufacturers and say, well, it's encapsulated. Like, my favorite is the synthetic rubber industry. I mean, PVC industry has been controlled disclosure. They want to manage the disclosure, but it's so big. They get so much pressure. They have to give information. So they only want to give the information they want to manage. The synthetic rubber industry has basically said, no, we're not talking about it. That's it. That's where they leave it. And, um, and then they'll say, well, you know, it, it doesn't matter because what's in there is encapsulated. And we'll talk about test methods and, and, and things that happen with test methods later. And, um, you know, it may be encapsulated in a steady state, but I'm going to say if it's rubber floor, rubber floors are maintained by basically a, a mid, medium speed, um, I'm trying to think of a term that wouldn't be a flooring related term for people, but in terms of like a swing machine type with a diamond pad or 5,000 pad, generates heat in the floor and it brings the oils in the rubber to the surface. Do you think it's still encapsulated? Does only the bad stuff come out? Or I mean only the good stuff comes out and the bad stuff stays encapsulated? But there is no test method for that. So these are the kind of things where we really have to challenge ourselves. And that's what I'm saying. If we could just talk about it, be transparent about what's there, it would be good. That's, that's sort of my view. Uh, but in terms of the proprietary, if there's a third party certification and we're disclosing impacts, it's, um, it's, then there's a comfort level. And that's actually the, one of the discussions within the HPDC now is how do they do that? Because, for example, we've got that with our, our finish. We don't want to disclose our factory finish is renewable and all that other stuff, and we've spent millions upon millions to develop it. I don't want to hand the formulation to my competitor. So, you know, they, they, it is an issue. Uh, it's not so much necessarily what's in it, but you're also giving away your competitive advantage. Right. 
And as long as you have the third party with the non-disclosure, manufacturers will participate. So how is this impacting a construction market? Um, what are the lead before impacts? What are we seeing come out of it? And I, I've adapted this section um, over the years uh, or over the, or the, the months since this is a very rapidly moving discussion. So I'm going to try and sort of tap you into some of the current discussions of what's going on. Okay, first we talk about lead and we talk about the, uh, the, the previous versions of lead and some of the challenges were, I just want to make sure I'm not talking too long, that's all. Um, you have single attribute based, you have rapidly renewable recycled content, indoor air quality, it was all attribute based. This, I'm just going to show you what a joke something like recycled content is. How many people think it's recycled content? PVC guys love to talk about recycled content. We have recycled content. We're guilty of this, so I can admit this, is you know what we do? We're producing product. We have production scraps in the facility. If we put those back into the product, that's considered good manufacturing practice. It doesn't get you any lead points because it's not waste stream diversion. You only get your recycled content points if it's waste stream diversion, which means it has to be on its way to a landfill but you divert it to somewhere else. So what we do is instead of doing good manufacturing practice, what all the manufacturers did is we ship them to a third party and the third party ships them back to our competitor. So in order to get points, most of the PVC industry, most, I'm not going to say all, but the vast majority of the PVC industry, what they did was add carbon footprint and a third party processor to do what they were already doing. That's, what, that's my whole thing about products with sustainable attributes. That's what you get, is you get the existing product with whatever bolted into it or bolted onto it so that you could get points. So what happened with version four? It, uh, it gives you a multi-attribute focus. It does spend time on the supply chain. Um, you've got the start of recognizing with a credit for EPDs doesn't matter whether the EPD is good or bad. There's just credit for it. But it does have a focus on the supply chain. And that's one of the areas where I think it, it's very important because then you're touching on the chemical side of this. Um, it doesn't have a true emphasis on ecotoxicity and human toxicity. Um, it needs a better understanding of chemicals of concern. and Again, that issue where cre credit's being given for compliance rather than selecting the appropriate product with the least impact. But it, it, it's considered a step. Is at least we force or we give credit for the EPD as a market driven tool, it will go that direction. Um, it's interesting. If you want to know what you're up against, um, not this past year, uh, but the prior year when Greenville was in San Francisco. Um, at that time, uh, the pilot versions of LEED version 4 had one credit in it for the avoidance of chemicals of concern. One credit, that's all it was in. And if anybody remembers that time, two to three weeks before, there were back-to-back front-page USA Today articles slamming LEED. In, on USA Today, on two consecutive days, two to three weeks before Greenville. That was not an accident. That was not even writing. It was an advertorial. It was a paid-for advertorial from the chemical industry as a shot across the bow to say back off. Nothing more than that. The hysteria continues. You want to touch on the supply chain. February 27, 2014, the Ohio State Senate voted to ban lead version 4, taking steps to make it illegal in the state of Ohio. How many people have seen this? Okay. Why now? And why aimed at lead version 4 when prior versions were utilized by the state for almost all their schools and other buildings? All of a sudden, lead 4 stepped into the supply chain. It started to try and pull the curtain back. Um, lead version 4 reaches further into the supply chain. Ohio is an industrial state and home of the largest synthetic rubber companies in the world. That's why.
So what was the other hysteria? Product tech, transparency declarations. As soon as people really started talking about, you know what, you can't ignore toxicity. Uh, you got, you, you ha toxicity has to get discussed. So you got the pressure from the architects, not from people like me. People like me, I'm just a squeaky wheel in the industry. I, I got into an argument at a, you know, at a, one, one of the industry functions and it was a P PVC guy and a rubber guy there saying, why are you such a, basically a pain in the ass? And I said, it's pretty simple. Is I said, we'll go out in the parking lot, I'll put my product down, you put your product down, you put your product down, let's light them on fire, let's roast marshmallows on it, will you eat the marshmallows from above your fire? Because I'll eat the ones from above mine. And it's because, because they said, oh, it's encapsulated the product, these toxicity issues don't matter, and they do. So in order to try and address product transparency, they, the RSCI introduced product transparency de declarations. It was developed by the Resilient Floor Covering Institute, by themselves. It included installation and use and excluded raw materials, pre-processing, production, transport, end of life. So they addressed toxicity in it, but then they only did it for the installation and use piece. They looked at, they eliminated raw materials, pre-processing, production, transport, end of life, all the other impacts associated that might be associated with the composition of the product. So again, they're playing with the LCA science again, with a marketing story. Um, but because they looked at installation and use, this aggravated me enough that we were going to talk about the test methods. All right? So here's the danger. They like floor score. It was developed by them, it, which is based on the science of California 1350. It's an IAQ standard. Okay? So their whole version is stuff's not coming out of the product, so it doesn't matter. Now let's talk about... Um, what actually happens. The test method is a dark chamber with a control temperature of 23 degrees C, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the way a test method is. Good, fine test method. I'm not knocking it. But specifically, when you look at PVC, numerous scientific studies will detail the fact that an increase in temperature and with an exposure to light of PVC rapidly increases the emissions from PVC. You've all experienced it. You get a brand new car, that first sunny day, you got, after that first sunny day, you got the film on the inside of your windshield. Where did that come from? Those are the phthalates coming out of your dashboard that with the exposure to light and heat inside your car, you rapidly increase the emissions of the phthalates leaving the product. Okay? So that's what that film is. And so my question to you very simply is, okay, so does that mean you air condition schools all summer? Or does it get warm in there in the summer? Because if you go 10 degrees C increase, you get a 10 times increase in emissions. And these are PPTs that come out of the product. They stay there. They don't go away. They are in that school and in whatever is there at that time. You get hot spots. We design without light. We design without windows? No, you get hot spots that come in through the windows that are exposing on a patient room floor. If it warms the temperature of the floor, the emission rates increase. So these are the kind of things we have to ask as it relates to test methods. If we're going to talk about toxicity, this is why toxicity potentials matter. Because the test methods can also don't necessarily represent the total exposure. Does that make sense to everybody? That's also, for example, if you don't understand the light and heat with PVC products, is why the single probably worst thing for the health of children is a vinyl shower curtain. It's highly plasticized because it's incredibly flexible. In a very confined space, a bathroom, with extremely high temperatures of a shower. It is perfect storm. There's, a, there's our studies now going back that are linking a lot of these disorders in young autism to the advent of the vinyl shower curtain as being one of the critical contributors to it. The good thing is, old person like me, I didn't have to experience any of them. Um, but it's interesting, you know, we talk about PBTs. For example, if you compared, if you took my blood and compared it to some of you young person like you, you'll find a much higher concentration of lead in my blood than in your blood. And that goes back to, I grew up in the era of leaded gasoline. So back before unleaded was invented, when I was young, uh, everything ran on leaded gasoline. 
So that is still in me today. So, what's, again, getting into what all this hysteria is about, I want to compare data for you. Now, I said in these reports, we are actually disclosing in our EPDs our impacts, good products and bad products. These are, you have the full impacts as measured by use talks and through the standard EPD format because what I want to do is illustrate for you, and we're the only people that disclose like this. I would argue we're probably 10 years ahead of the industry in terms of where anybody's going to be willing to disclose at that level. Um, I'm going to use, and rather than use the raw numbers, I'm going to use marmolium two millimeter sheet. That's our, as, as the baseline. Basically, when you look at it, I'm going to be honest, that's probably of the disclosed information in the marketplace, the most environmentally friendly flooring material you could choose. Okay, so that it's good as to use as a baseline. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do multiplier to what it is. So if, if 1.07 means it's 1.07 times worse. If it's 2.3, it's 2.3 times worse. So you look at it as multiplier as you go through. Now what we know, remember I said in 2009, Europe did all this, and they just came out this year what are in the flooring industry called category EPDs. So what they do is they take how much you sell as a manufacturer and what your impacts are, and how much your competitors sell, and how much your competitors sell, and they build just an EPD for the category. So it's totally representative of everything that's sold, and it's not personal to any single manufacturer. So it's a category. So if you choose linoleum flooring, or you choose heterogeneous PVC vinyl, this is the total environmental impact, okay? But they only did it for the EPD categories, no HPD categories, okay? We did uh, what I know is that when we look at our sheet vinyl, it's better than average. It's not the best, but it's a better than average PVC sheet versus the category EPD that's present for Erfney. And I know that our LVT is a much better than average. And so these are all our products, and these are our disclosures. And I want to kind of show you why there's this fear of talking about this. So if we look at the EPD categories, this is global warming potential, this is ozone layer depletion. So global warming potential is pretty much CO2 driven, C ozone layer depletion, CFCs. So you go down, worst case, it's two to three times, maybe six times worse. Now these are all pretty small numbers. I mean, argu arguably they could be considered equal. The numbers are that small if you looked at them, but there is a difference. Acidification potential, Eutrophication potential. Those are ag prone towards an agricultural-based product. Our product's agricultural-based, so you can see PVC-based products actually do better in those categories. What I find interesting about it is we will measure eutrophication impacts, so we care whether fish can breathe, but we don't seem to care whether we can breathe. That's an interesting analogy when you look at how we look at toxicity. Photochemical ozone creation potential, those are your, your ethylenes, uh, again, your low level. Again. The number's six times, no big deal. Now your non-renewables, abiotic depletion, okay, obviously PVC much higher, 14 times, four times. But again, not big numbers, okay? But differences, everyone sees that, right? Now we'll move in to the toxicity discussion. Let's look at ecotoxicity. And you look at a marmolean-based product versus um, a, a PVC-based product. Now you're looking at 600 to 700 times the impact. All right, and this is on ecotoxicity. This is more your dioxin from the production of the VCM. That's at the, the base of everything in terms of, of what you produce plastic from. Now look at your human health impacts. So carcinogenic, well, 60 to 70 times. Non-carcinogenic, those are your phthalates, 13,000 to 17,000 times more of an impact. I also want to note, at no point is this product zero, and no product is zero. Everything has a potential. So I use that as a reference point, but the reference point is not zero. But you see the numbers. This is what the PVC industry doesn't want to talk about. It's that simple. 
and what those potentials are because they're not ready to adjust it. They're not ready to adapt to it. Um, some other things that trans how transparency makes a difference. They just produced an EPD on, uh, for example, the rubber flooring category. So this actually comes from one of the other manufacturers' websites from it. So I just cut and copied and paste. And I said the rubber industry is interesting because they don't really disclose, but they like to tell you the natural rubber story. Okay? Anybody know without looking what the content of natural rubber in the industry is used? in all the flooring sold in the United States. 0.6% of the product is natural white rubber. 27.4% is SBR, styrol butadiene rubber. Um, styrol, an endocrine disruptor, butadiene, a carcinogen. That's your Ohio argument right there. And if you didn't believe that they were concerned about it, there's a huge research project that Ohio State's doing. And this is great. This is the good thing. If we had transparency, this is actually a good thing. Ohio State is working on developing this little yellow flower that basically what they can get out of pressing it will replace SBR and make it actually go back to being agriculturally based. So, you know, I, there are good things that can happen if you have transparency. But this just shows you just, you know, that piece of information. Because a lot of people perceive rubber floors as being, oh, I'm getting a rubber tree and all that other stuff. 0.6%. Um, I know our discussions were having an impact because the end of every one of the EPDs has this statement in it that says, ecotoxicity and human health assessments are not part of this PCR and are not addressed in this EPD. The current available models used to calculate ecotoxicity and human health assessment impact categories have a large amount of uncertainty and variation in their results. Over time, it is expected that research will improve. Over time means when they're ready to disclose, when they've been able to address it. As I said, use talks exist today. It's clear, it's globally recognized. We may not want to recognize it necessarily in this country, but it's a clear, globally recognized measurement methodology. The other, you know, when in doubt, fix it. Phthalate free. How many people have heard about phthalate free PVCs? Okay? I'll tell you what phthalate free PVCs are. Um, Historically, I'd say for the last 10 years, any reasonable manufacturer used as a plasticizer. First of all, people don't understand what plasticizers are. They, they're, they're what make plastic flexible. PVC by its nature is rigid. To make it flexible, you add plasticizers that actually then make it flexible. DINP was the plasticizer of choice because it was considered the least harmful of all the plasticizers that have been used over the years. Okay? Um, DINP was recently banned in children's toys in California in the last year. So if you have product with DINP and Ascara warning label in California right now. In place of DINP, when you hear phthalate free, it's not, oh nice, don't confuse phthalate free with bio-based. No connection whatsoever. DINP has been replaced by DOTP, which is a, instead of being a phthalate, is a terephthalate. So it's just outside the chemical definition of being a phthalate, so they make the claim of being phthalate free. Um, it's a fairly new chemical, lacks any third party testing, currently sole source, sole source from ExxonMobil, the people that said lead in your gasoline won't hurt you for 30 years, um, and have provided the health and toxicity related to this point. So this is what happens when you don't disclose impact, you don't talk about impacts, and you don't measure the impacts, you get marketing. This is a way to get away from the phthalate argument by putting something that they can claim from a marketing point of view is phthalate free. Sad part is it's gathering momentum in the marketplace. If it does, and we have to respond, our PVCs, we won't be able to do a disclosure like this because there's no toxicity testing for the product. So as a rush in the marketplace, we're entering into the great unknown. That's what's even more concerning. Yes. So ExxonMobil has or hasn't provided the health and They've provided it, but there's no third party. Okay, they there's no third party testing. They said, oh, it's great. And, you know, in theory, it, it may be. But you know, I'd like to have a little more confidence in that level. So. Um, so, again, full transparency is what we need. I'm not going to go through all this. 
Um, just so you have, a, again, a, my scope on the chemical industry, this is from a book called Death by Rubber Duck. It's actually an interesting book. Um, but there are 82,000 chemicals in use in the United States with 700 new ones added each year. Of these 82,000 some odd, only 650 are monitored through TRI, that's your uh, toxicity release inventory. Only 200 have ever been tested for toxicity and only five have been banned under the Toxic Substance Control Act. Not even asbestos is banned anymore. A known carcinogen has killed nearly 45,000 Americans over the past 30 years. Um, the ban on asbestos was actually lifted in 1991 because you could reduce liability in lawsuits associated with asbestos. So those are all OSHA complaints. All the issues with asbestos are now regulated back to being OSHA complaints for improper workplace performance and the liabilities cap because asbestos isn't even banned in this country anymore. Um, from that year at Greenville, the reason I put this slide up here isn't the list. What I want to say is it doesn't matter what your raw material is and it doesn't matter that your business that you're in. Okay? There are PVC manufacturers and rubber manufacturers that are on the transparency side and there's PVC manufacturers and rubber manufacturers that are on the, what they called the toxic supporters. This was actually an insert in Greenville. I just put it up here. But what I'm trying to say is there's chemical companies over here on the good side. It, all it has to do is it's a willingness to be transparent, a willingness to participate in the process, a willingness to, to open up the information. There's furniture manufacturers. There's everybody over here. And that's the key. It's not raw material dependent. Anybody can be transparent. You just have to be willing to put it out there and take the steps. This is the letter I mentioned from a design firm. You know, basically, these are coming out from a lot of the design firms, and this is our, sort of our challenge to people, um, is that you know, basically by January 1st, 2015, if you don't have an EPD or an HPD, you're out of the library. That's, that's long story short of it in terms of uh, um, coming from. But this one I actually thought was particularly interesting. This happened last July and shows that there's also a concern that goes well beyond just the design community, that the general contractor community is supporting it. SCANS is one of the world's largest general contractors. And they dropped their membership in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce because of the commerce's protection of the chemical industry. And um, they view that, and the attacks on LEED, and that they view that toxicity in a building matters to a general contractor. He owns that building. He built it, and they want to be cognizant of it. They're a professional outfit. So it, it goes just beyond the design community and the construction world. So this is our whole point. Transparency is not raw material dependent. We produce PVC products. In support of it, we put it in. Anybody else can do it. There's a list of people. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, furniture manufacturer, PVC-based, PVC-free, PVC-based. doesn't matter. Um, could have put Mondo over here as a rubber person that's trying to disclose, okay, on the good side. So, my summary, um, basically, as I said, these are going to be the foundation of that rating system that's going to come. Um, if we don't do something, <clears throat> everything's going to be a five-star product. It's going to be a validation of the status quo. <coughs> so now's the time to change. And we asked that, you know, everybody in their role, demand full transparency from all your product manufacturers when specifying building materials. Ask product representatives if their company supports full disclosure of chemicals of concern to its customers. Ask if their products emit compounds that might impact human health and the environment. And be willing to consider all the ways a product can contribute to a healthy environment. So with that, thank you. Yes. Um, I mentioned liability earlier. Um, it's been like to have a lot of time. Something where it's you know, middle of the list of and then PSG, we're going to look at it, send it back. Mm -hmm. How do we take responsibility and look at liability and look at chemicals and all these different products and architect and designers? Basically, basically yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the other smoke screens that's coming up is, is this whole that you're increasing liability. Right now, liability, you have to remember, is a legal discussion. It may not be a common sense discussion. It may not, and it's certainly not a scientific discussion. Um, so in terms of liability, 
if you follow all applicable laws and that product is legal, you're not going to carry any liability for it in terms of it. And the key is, like nobody, asbestos was in just about every product for a long time. But the companies that got in trouble for asbestos, not everybody went bankrupt, the companies that got in trouble for asbestos were the companies that were still using it or using it incorrectly after the laws changed. That's, and we're misrepresenting their product, that's when you got into the asbestos issue. And it would be no different with this. There are no legal ramifications or increased liability. I mean, you could, you could say, I mean, you know, I've put toxicity disclosures out for all of our products, full disclosure. There's a legal argument that says, oh, you're putting yourself at risk. There's also a legal argument that says, I've conformed everybody much more transparently than anybody else in the industry. And, you know, it's, I, HPD, HPDC in connection is taking a hard look at this. They're doing a thorough study. I would really defer for official comment to them, but I'm just looking at it from the past examples and my knowledge of the legal system. Any other questions? Okay. I appreciate everybody's time today. I thank you very much for, for taking the time to come out. Hopefully you find it useful.